All right. Welcome back, everyone. All right. So, uh, welcome. Ah, not getting it today. Welcome, James, that Persian void dweller, T O A F C Chan. Woo! <laughs> okay. Uh, you may notice that I might sound a bit different today. That is because. Oh, a little, a certain little somebody today was quite naughty and broke mom's microphone and by accident and he got a certain talking to. Luckily, my old one is still here and it, it kind of works. Oh, hello, Corey. Welcome to the stream. <laughs> All right. I hope you guys can hear me okay, and I hope the sound quality isn't too shitty. Um, please tell me if you can't hear me very well. I know this microphone does not pick up the sound as well as the other one. Okay, uh, hello Mr. Valdak, welcome to the stream. So yeah, until we get a new one, you, uh, we'll just have to make do with this, the older one. Oh, uh, welcome, oh yeah, uh, thanks James. It's perfect? Great. Okay. So <laughs> I know G Chan. I I just want them. I just want the sound quality to be good, cause I really uh I I really want to get a really nice microphone eventually, so my sound doesn't sound like garbage. <laughs> I will, Void Dweller. I will. We've already picked out a new one. You can barely tell the difference out. <laughs> Okay, okay. I know, I know this one is a bit quieter. They can't pick up the sound as well. But uh, that said, last time, let me get actually into the story here. Uh, we met up with our two protagonists. Protagonists, Marie and Higginbana herself. And, uh, oh, we're gonna replace it away. And basically, this is a very, uh, quite a unique story that Marie was killed by her evil, disgusting, perverted teacher who was sexually abusing her and like, ugh, just horrible. And basically, uh, they created a legend with their illicit meetings about the yokai called Mezzo Mezzo. And apparently the real yokai called, uh, oh, well, thank you so much, Corey. And apparently the real yokai called Higginbana said, you know what? You are quite good. Would you like to become a real yokai? Oh, I think it's quite, I think the sound quality is bad when I rewatch. Oh yeah, I can check the glossary. That's right, let's look at the glossary. This music is very Higurashi and Umineko. <laughs> Doesn't this sound like an Umineko track? It totally does. This is like... You can just tell by the way it sounds. <laughs> and basically, her teacher also claimed the title of Mezzo Mezzo. And Higginbana wasn't expecting that, so now... Marie has to fight for the title of the yokai Mezzo Mezzo, and because she's dead, uh, if she doesn't get it within a certain time limit, she will be free from Higamana's protection and be able to, and uh, just basically any, any other of the ghosts around there could, are free to eat her. It, doesn't it, James? Like, doesn't it? Like, seriously? It sounds like it could break into the hope uh, let motif at any time right now. Okay, let's read this. Mezzo mezzo is the sound of someone sobbing, usually after losing their self-respect or from having low self-esteem. Often the head hangs limply as the person cries. And now the BGM is loud. Oh yeah, that's because it was... Oh yeah, that's right. I have to get used to changing the BGM volume uh, between Ever17 and Higginbana. I hope it's better. Um... I hope it's better now, um, the uh, volume of the music. 
Because Ever 17's volume is too soft. <laughs> okay, back to this. In Higginbana, Mezzo Mezzo is given the Japanese honorific suffix san, which is a, uh, 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 you know what san means. Hmm. These arrows, they do nothing. <laughs> Okay, we know what a yokai is, right? I'll just, uh... Yeah, the music is even loud in my headphones, which is something, because I turned my headphone volume way, way down. Whether mischievous or malicious, yokai are supernatural demons, ghosts, and monsters from Japanese folklore and horror stories. Oh, wow, it even breaks into a jump drum beat. The term yokai covers a wide range of beings from ghost disguises beautiful women to colossal centipedes. The most common yokai are tengu, long-nosed demons, yep, oni, ogres, kappa, humanoid turtles, and kitsune, fox spirits, and I'm sure that all of these are types of demons that all of y'all have run into in many different anime and games and Japanese stories, because, yep. Although some yokai can be beneficial, like rain spirits, generally they exist to cause humans misery either through trickery or fear. And usually make good cannon fodder for uh, protagonists in video games. <laughs> I agree, Mr. Valdek. I think they're comp complementing each other really well. Oh, here we go. The Seven Mysteries. It, it is like a, a thing. The Seven Mysteries is a Japanese concept first in the importance of the number seven. Seven days in a week, seven wonders, seven deadly sins. But none, none of those are Japanese concepts. This concept became popular in the Edo period of Japanese history with tales of unexplained phenomena that turned into urban legends. These tales usually took place in a single area and comprised of seven phenomena. E.g. Seven Mysteries of Sua Shrine. Is that... Is that a Toho? Isn't that... No, no, because that's uh, Moria Shine, where uh, Sane works. But Suako is there. I I'm getting confused. I thought it was Moria Shine. But I do know that Suako is there uh, with that and, and Hanako. And ah, I'm not too familiar with that part of Toho lore. This trend became popular in Japanese schools and seven school mysteries is a popular concept that is important in TV dramas, anime, and manga. Yep. Okay, we have officially gone way too long without getting into the main story. It's eight fucking minutes. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let's get back into it. Okay, so I have to... Uh, unlike, um... Okay, so it's not like Umineko where... There's a separate the load is not on the main menu. The load, you have to do attend and then load. I see. Same apparition. I totally, I, I really think it's quite enjoyable. Talk about Marie Moria not coming home last night quickly turned into an uproar. Oh wow, her last name is Moria? I, I forgot that! Oh my god. That probably is a Toho reference in that case. Was it an accident? Or did she get involved in some trouble? The last anyone saw of the ever lonely and friendless Marie was at school that day. Please tell me if you can't hear me, by the way, please, because that, that was a huge issue with this microphone. As for what happened after school, it was anyone's guess. Police were looking for information and posting flyers with drawings of what Marie wore that day on bulletin boards here and there. Ah, uh, that's right. I guess they don't have uh, school uniforms here. Making sure not to overlook any witnesses. They posted them all around town. 
The police even came to question the homeroom teacher, Kanamori. Kanamori said he didn't know what had happened after school, and the police departed feeling satisfied. It even became an urgent topic at the staff meeting. And as a precaution, in case of a second incident, there was recent talk about after-school groups or bodyguards and the like. At first, these topics made Kanamori's heart race, but after a day or two he became confident. Because the police investigation hadn't found Marie's corpse, he was focused on what happened after school. He began to feel he had completely slipped away from that line of investigation. He was asked by a child from his class where Marie could have disappeared to. And Connemore refused, as if in jest, and said, Could it be the curse of Mezzo Mezzo song? I wonder. <laughs> oh, of course not. I can't believe I just said that. Let's make this a little secret. Okay? Ugh. As expected, the students took these words all too well. Having her treated as a victim of Mezzo Mezzo san, the school yokai everyone is crazy about lately, came as an added bonus. In school, the rumors about Mezzo Mezzo san ran, san ran wild, and a new school ghost story began to take hold. With that in mind, Kanamori started to believe more and more that he was Mezzo Mezzo san. It was that kind of day. After school, on his way to the staff room, in the middle of the empty hallway, suddenly he fell. Hell yeah, Marie! Woo! When he fell, it was as if something had caught his elbow. It tore his skin and made him bleed. It wasn't a serious injury, but he pressed a tissue to his elbow so it wouldn't stain his shirt. Oh my, Kanamori Sensei, are you alright? You're hurt. Oh, that was the vice principal. <laughs> God damn it! Oh my, Kanamori Sensei, are you alright? You're hurt. Called out the vice principal who saw him by chance. Ah, how embarrassing. <laughs> I must have bumped into something when I fell. I probably just slipped on a puddle a student neglected to wipe up or something. Kanamori said that, even though he knew more than anyone that he hadn't lost his footing like that. While he smoothed things over with the vice principal, he looked at the hall, and he was left doubting he could have slipped on something. Sensei, you seem to be bleeding quite a bit. It's seeping through your tissue. <laughs> You're right. How annoying. Perhaps I should head up to the infirmary and get myself patched up. You do that. Oh, nurse! Kanamori sense I seem to have hurt himself. Would you take a look at him? Hello, Nagels! Welcome to the stream. Conveniently, from the other side of the hallway, the school nurse appeared. Oh, wow. Okay, she's a character. Oh my, I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make her Jessica because she looks very sporty. Oh my, uh, no, not, not Jessica, God damn it, Kyrie. Oh my, are y'all all right? Your elbow. The injury itself wasn't a big deal, but he didn't want the blood to stain his clothes. Gonomori thought as much and he calmly headed to the school infirmary. The inside of the infirmary was filled with the smell of disinfectant and fleeing the fe feeling the pain from cotton wool soaked in that disinfectant brought back memories of my elementary school days. Oh, oh, God damn it. Now the narration had switched to him. 
The inside of the infirmary was filled with the smell of disinfectant and feeling the pain from co cotton wool soaked in that disinfectant brought back memories of my elementary school days. It was nostalgic. Before I knew there was something greater than being human, in those times, I always felt looked down upon by those around me. Not wanting to be looked down upon, and wanting to look down on others. In those times, I bottled up my aggression against them. The nurse doesn't have a name? Oh my god. Seriously. Wow. Okay. And by looking down on Marie, I finally felt as if I had relieved myself from that complex. I didn't think I wanted to be a killer. But if this purge didn't free me from my complex for the rest of my life, how long would I have to live in despair? If I thought about it, as for how long I could go on living. If I suppose Marie's life was ended for someone else's amusement, I thought it would be natural for them to go on living, seeking new ventures in life like the different links in the food chain. I was the predator. Marie was the prey. And that was all there was to it. If I didn't eat her in the fu then in the future, she'd be eaten by someone else. And so, I ate her early on. And in a deeply compassionate way, Reset her existence. Although, even in her next life, she'll probably be eaten again. <laughs> that girl is just that hard to teach, after all. While I was immersed in my fantasies, I had a somewhat large band-aid put on and then ended my treatment. When I mentioned my thanks, and stood up to leave. Ding, 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 tink. A small series of sounds reached my ears. Something the matter? <laughs> no, I heard something just now. As if something fell over. Okay, now back to the omniscient narrator. Kanamori saw, saw a small white thing had fallen over and picked it up. Huh? It was made of plastic or some. It was made of plastic or something, and it looked like a small button. Oh God damn it! Okay, uh, the, the the it's weird. I'm not that confused about when the characters are speaking, but I am that confused when the. When the narration switches from the om omniscient narrator to a character narrating. Even saying it was a button, it wasn't even a millimeter in diameter, but he understood it must have been an accessory for something. But when he turned his thoughts as to what it might have fallen from. Oh! She's gonna, she's doing the old telltale heart thing. I see. Oh! I see. That button is gonna follow him around and it's gonna drive him fucking insane. I bet. I see. She's doing the old telltale heart. Marie has read Poe. Good job. But when he turned his thoughts as to what it might have fallen from, he looked up above the medicine cabinets. And he understood what it was. Oh. 
Oh. That was something particularly out of place in this infirmary. A western doll. It couldn't hide its worn-out state from its degradation over time. But there was no doubt it certainly wasn't something cheap. See, now it's switching back to him as narration. I compared the shape of the object I just picked up with the door many times. And I sensed it was certainly a button from the stroll's clothes. Oh, I see. But I think he's going to be followed by buttons now everywhere. <laughs> the stroll's button probably fell off. Oh, oh, is that so, sweetheart? I'll have to sew that back on after y'all leave. Because they say this child's the master of this infirmary, after all. Oh, she is kind of like a mini Beatrice. Masters, this cute doll. Kanamori stood on his toes and took down the doll that sat above the medicine cabinet looking down on them. Oh my god, Higginbana can do a creepy doll form? Oh my god. Can she go all Chucky on his ass? Because that would be really good. That would be really great. I saw a trailer for for Chucky when I was like five or six years old and it scared the absolute shit out of me. I was like, I was terrified for years because of that trailer. It's like not, not so much anymore, but I, I refuse to watch that movie and like I just seriously... Oh, Higginbon is your is a flower, I see. It's a type of flower in English known as the spider lily or hell flower. And it's the flower on the title screen. Oh, that's really interesting. If he starts seeing the doll everywhere, like that would be insane. Kanamori stood on his toes and took down the doll that sat above the medicine cabinets, looking down on them. It wasn't Saw a uh, Void Dweller, it was uh, Chucky. That doll was uniquely western and had a vaguely cold air to it. Oh, nobody showed it to me. Uh, my mom and I were watching a movie late at night and it just happened to show during the commercials. It was a, it was a family friendly movie too. Oh my God, DQA, welcome to the stream. That's absolutely right. It's kind of like her vessel, I guess that's what it would be. Kanamori had politely called the doll cute, but in his mind he thought it wasn't cute but eerie. Yeah, but I've also heard about it from the former nurse, you see. She said that this doll was here long before she started working. And it had been watching over the infirmary, just infirmary, just like it is now. <laughs> How absurd. Isn't it something some student lost? Well, I wouldn't think there's a student who would bring us such a splendid doll and simply forget about it. Oh, that's right. They say this doll is a cursed doll. And students are afraid of it, you see. <laughs> so, is this one of the school's seven mysteries? Now that I think of it, the doll in the infirmary dances in the middle of the night. Oh, so I've heard from one of the students. I see, so they were t 
Talking about this doll, eh? I've heard of Creepshow. Is that the one with the terrifying little tiki thing? Is that the thing? Because the, I could totally know what that... I think I know what that means. If, if that's the thing that I'm thinking of. Oh, and Void Dweller. The Redeads were really scary, definitely. They scared a lot of people as a kid. As kids, absolutely. Long ago, a doll that began, belonged to a girl who died in this infirmary. Some took her spirit and became a yokai or some such. <laughs> no matter what school y'all go to, there are plenty of stories like that. Oh, that's right. I don't know who named that doll, but sure enough, it has a name. They say it's called Higginbana. <laughs> Higginbana. Hmm. It's not a particularly fortunate name, is it? Indeed, it just might suit this strange doll perfectly. However, isn't it wrong to be scaring the students by keeping that kind of doll there is a decoration. Well, there's also talk of a curse put on those who throw that doll away. <laughs> it's not that I believe in curses, but I ain't taking my chances. But since it's been watching over students in this infirmary for a long, long time, I'd feel kind of bad, you know? She sits there, making sure the injuries of the students who come here don't get worse. And she protects them. Is that so? But where does this button go, I wonder? Here. I'll sew it on later. See? It's her right sleeve button. I bet it's the... Yep! Okay. Yep. Kick his ass, Higginbana. I love that this is kind of like a horror movie seen from the perspective of the ghost. I think that's really cool. Really original, I think. Right. Right. Sleeve. Bottom. Those were casual words. But it was something Kanamori wanted to forget, and yet could not. Bits and pieces from his disposed memory began to stir. Yes. A regret from that night he disposed of Marie's corpse. It was an uncomfortable feeling. Just before disposing of Marie's body, when shining a light on the body to make sure nothing was missing, he certainly saw Marie's right sleeve button had been torn. That night his attention was invariably divided. And so he didn't see how a single button mattered. He ignored it. But even so, it still left him with a bad feeling. That memory revived in his mind with a yelp as if a small rock had gotten inside his sock. Oh, I gotta hate it when that happens. The doll's torn off button. If it hadn't been the right sleeve, he wouldn't have noticed anything. Even so, it had to be the right sleeve's button. The same as the one torn from Marie's clothes. Her right sleeve button. At that moment, Kanamori felt as if the eerie western doll named Higginbana was sneering at him. What a foolish man. There are only two things that can evaporate or disappear from this world. Know what they are. Huh? What are you talking about? 
the reconception that there was no way a doll could talk to me, blurred with that question. <laughs> the things that disappear. Water. Ungrateful souls. Just those two. <laughs> she laughed at her own joke sarcastically. But the doll quickly froze her laughter and continued. Are you looking for Marie's right sleeve button? What is that button made of? Water? Grateful souls? There's no way a button could be made of water or souls. If it were top quality, it might have been made from shells. Or if it was cheap, then it'd be plastic at best. Ding, 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 ding. Right. It's made of things that aren't water or souls. So, there's no way it can disappear from this world. <laughs> it can't dissolve or evaporate. So, it must still be where it was dropped. Right? It'll be where it was dropped. Always. Until it's been found by someone. It'll be there forever. Won't it? Those words began to pain me. It was an inconvenience that most people would have wanted to quickly forget. And until today I had forgotten it. That bad feeling I had about Marie's button. But no matter how I wanted to forget it, the button itself wouldn't disappear. Yep, Void Dweller. Uh, luckily mine were more action figurey. And made of plastic, they weren't like uh, Chucky dolls. Thank God. It was surely there, even now, where it was dropped. Until someone picks it up, it's waiting there even now. That's right. I mustn't forget the button that came off her right sleeve. There was no way the button was torn off from the beginning. If she were a crude boy, she wouldn't care at all about a single button torn from her clothes. But she was a girl. If a button was torn off, she would have certainly put it back on again. Even Marie was the methodical type. She, she wouldn't go through her daily routine with a button missing from her right sleeve. So uh, that button must have been torn off on that day. Kanamora Sensei? Is something the matter? You all look like you're about to break out in a cold sweat. <laughs> no. Thank you very much. I just remembered. I have some business to take care of. Sorry, no. If you'll excuse me. Already, the foundation for my mental state and sense of security were gone. If I continued aimlessly like this, sometime, someone will find that button. Because the police have long known about the clothes Marie wore the day she disappeared. If by chance it winds up in their hands, they'll probably realize it belongs to Marie's clothing. Uh, I was not afraid of Furby's Void Dweller. Those came out when I was much older. My sister and I owned a Furby that we shared. But I will tell you guys something since we're in a horror mood. When I was little, I was scared of Chuck E. Cheese. And I, I like, I'm kind of, 
I don't really I don't really have any strong opinions about FNAF, but I will say that just FNAF being a success vindicates me after I was made fun of so much for being scared of Chuck E. Cheese. I am saying, like, I am just reveling in FNAF's success. It's like, you all didn't believe me. You laughed at me when I thought Chuck E. Cheese was scary. But now look at you. you have, like, Chuck E. Cheese, like, is the freaking inspiration for, like, a really successful horror series. So, ha, ha, ha. I was right. I was scared of Chuck E. Cheese before it was cool. God damn it. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, now back to the story. <laughs> what the hell am I doing? Need some carefree and letting this critical situation go. And where did that button fall off? Well, when I strangled her, that place, the old school building bathroom, in that stall. No, and yet. When I left there, I was sure I didn't leave any traces behind. Oh, but that was when I was in a hurry and only looked with a glance. I don't think I cared that much if a grain like fallen button escaped my sight. I'm sure of it. It's there. It's in there. In order to not be seen by anyone, I entered the old school building and stay there until I could be completely satisfied. All I could do was hold back my impatient mind and wait. In the infirmary, the nurse was still finishing up the day's work. And then she felt as if she heard a girl's laughter. Thinking there might still be students at school, she turned around. Oh, God damn it. I think, um, I think they switched back to the omniscient narrator. Thinking that there might be still students, students at school, she turned around. And the western doll quietly sitting atop the medicine cabinets caught her eye. Obviously, there was no way Higgin Barna could laugh. She was a doll, after all. Oh, thank you, Owe. You, you're okay with the Higginbana voice? That, that's nice, because I was worried about it. I gotta keep, you know, keep trying out new voices and see how they work. You know, that's how you get better. At least I think so, right? Is the, is the Beatrice as the narrator doing okay for you guys, too, or...? Or should I cut that out? The nurse might have been a little tired. She thought after going home today, she would quickly get to bed. <laughs> Which one is the better meso son? That'll be a sight, won't it? Waiting until a vote is boring. Don't you think it'd be better if the two involved decided it themselves? Woo wee! I must be tired. I think I'll call it a day and head out. Higginbana giggled as she imagined what was beginning to unfold from this point forward. Of course. It was impossible for that voice to reach the nurse's ears. Oh, hello, Lambda Delta. Welcome to the stream. Now then, Marie, Kanamori, please show me who is more fitting. Because everyone in our class is also hoping for something more interesting than a vote. Are you staying here, Kanamori Sensei? It won't be long until tomorrow, you know. 
<laughs> so, oh, God damn it! I keep giving the little kid voice to the vice principal. I don't know, like it's like I, I get caught. I get caught off guard because they're calling him sensei, and I think only the students would call him sensei. So I think it's a random student, but no. <sighs> Are you staying here, Ganamori Sensei? You won't be long until tomorrow, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much, the Vice Principal. I'm almost done here, so please let me stay here a bit longer. I understand, but please start finishing up. Because if you get too many overtime hours, we might even get a complaint from the Union ex Executive Office. <laughs> well, I apologize. But I'm going to have to excuse myself for the day. And I think you will be the last one out. Le oh, well, I God damn it! I <laughs> Wait. <sighs> they did it! They pulled a Fucking. They pulled a fucking sea bat on me. They had a quote and then started another quote with the same character. I hate it when they do that. How am I supposed to know who's talking? Well, I apologize, but I'm going to have to excuse myself for the day. Since I think it will be the last one out, please set up the security system. Oh, wait, nope, they didn't. I just made a complete idiot of myself. Well, I apologize, but I'm going to be have to excuse myself for the day. Since I think you'll be the last one out, please set up the security system. Also, if it's not on by 11 o'clock, the security company will then check, come check on if you don't call them. And that's going to totally fuck him over, isn't it? <laughs> Hilarious, Jichan. Be really careful, please. You don't want the police coming in on you when you're when you're covering up the evidence of a murder. Yes, I'm aware of that. I had forgotten about that, although I hadn't planned on taking that long to check the bathroom. But if I end up bumping heads with the security company, there'll be all kinds of trouble. Tonight, Kanamori had been more discreet than ever before. Even more discreet than the day he killed Marie. Awesome music. After seeing the vice principal cross the campus with his own eyes, Heeding the vice principal's advice, he called the security company to let them know he'd been working late that night. <laughs> this is perfect. Now this time as well, with no- Oh, this is perfect. Now this time as well, with no one else except himself in the school late at night, no one would pay him a visit. Damn, this is like freaking Terminator music right here. Doesn't this remind you of Terminator? My god. So he left the staff room, and before heading up to the old school building, he hid himself and watched to see if anyone was lurking in the school. Naturally. No sounds caught his attention. Only the cries of insects invested the old building. When he allowed himself a breath. Like Terminator Cross with uh, Bruce Falcon or Dragon Ball Z. Basically. It reminds me, it, it, yeah, a cross between Terminator and Vegeta's theme from Dragon Ball Z.
when he allowed himself a breath. It sounded as loud as a storm in his ears. Outside the window was pure darkness. Because inside he had a light. Outside of the glass in the hallway wasn't darkness. But the interior of the hallway reflected itself back again, like a mirror. So immediately after seeing that, he could see himself being reflected. Inside that massive school building, he was alone. In the day, the school bustled with many students and teachers. Doubtlessly, it was forming its own society. But that world was a different world separated from this one. It might even be said that the school occupied a different dimension. In that dimension, now he was alone. Society is order made by the many. And without numbers, when there's only one, it is the society no more. In other words, at this moment, in this separate school dimension, freed from the morals of so-called society, the world was his alone. If he ran in the halls during the day, he'd be scolded by his pupils. And if the vice principal saw him, he'd probably be made example of in front of the students. Because no running in the halls is one of those rules of society. However, this school in the depth of night has now been set free from that society. He really is going on a society rant, yep. <laughs> in other words, the rules created by society can no longer reach him. After all, this is a world where he alone exists. And even if he ran ahead at full speed, there wasn't anyone to worry about. Even in this moment, he was the lord of this world. He had transcend transcended his insignificant existence as a single man in the larger society. The more he thought about it, the more his impatience about quickly finding Marie's button began to dissipate. He began to feel surprised at how frustrated and impatient he was moments ago. If he had horns, if he had wings, then now more than ever, he lengthened and grew them, unfolded and extended them. If it started only as a laugh only in his mind, but then he realized even if that laugh escaped his mouth, in this world, no one else could hear it. And so, Kanamori, in an insanely wicked voice, from the depths of his soul, howled with laughter as he headed to the former school building. What a background. However, the moment he stepped foot into the old school building, his demonic confidence retreated. It was replaced with a discretion, as if his ruthlessness had been frozen in ice. It even froze his inner demon. If he turned the lights on in the old school building, he might be seen by someone in the neighborhood. And so without turning on the lights, he illuminated his path with a thin glow of a flashlight. The frail light illuminated the world of pure darkness. But like an illusion, 
The length of that hallway seemed to continue all the way to the horizon. And from the inside, all the doors had been closed and locked with the utmost care. And with this, he had completely severed himself from the world. He was torn and isolated from that school world. In other words, he was in a second world divided far away from the human world. Okay, that's Higginbonner. If you've gone this far from the human world, you'll get closer to the spirit world, won't you? He felt as if he had heard the voice of the doll whose button fell in the infirmary again. Of course, there was no way a doll could talk, so it was impossible for something that foolish to really happen. And yet, this world of the former school building, and the human world where dolls couldn't speak, were two vastly different places. Oh wow, the Higurashi Umineko sound effect is back. Maybe, here in this old school, lies a world where even dolls can talk. I'm so glad you like it, Chichan. I was really worried about the Higurashi voice. <laughs> That's absurd. He had wanted to laugh. And after he dared let it pass his mouth. He felt as if the power he had earlier had been cast aside like a lie. It was something ingrained in his mind since childhood. He remembered unfounded rumors regarding the strange world of the school at night. And now they began to slowly work their effect on his mind. He wanted to say how absurd it was again. This time, as he tried to say the words, they were caught like a lump in his throat. He thought saying them might cause him to remember that emotion. Horror. So he swallowed them back down. because the former school building was getting quieter and quieter. His desire to deny that emotion amplified more and more. There might have been a leak in a water pipe somewhere. That strange sound he hadn't noticed during the day filled the bathroom. He had wanted to run and turn on the lights inside, but he held back his desperation, and he illuminated the area with the thin beam of his flashlight. Perhaps that stall door... Perhaps that stall door where I killed Marie is still shut. That place where Marie's sobbing, Mezzo Mezzo came from. And that's right, it wouldn't even be designated a crime scene because nobody has any idea what happened, let alone where it happened. In the world in the daytime, this might have been a laughably cheap ghost story. But in this world, with about as much likelihood as a coin landing on tails, it held the chance of that horror of becoming reality. Even though all he had to do was shine his light on the bathroom stall, he hesitated. I have a feeling there might be a jump scare. <laughs> Damn it. The hell am I afraid of? <laughs> Marie's ghost isn't something that to be afraid of. It's that fallen button the police might find that's important. How oh, stupid. <laughs> With a senseless grin, he tried to boost his morale. 
as he shine his flashlight towards the stall. It was like he thought it would be. The stall hadn't been closed or anything. Naturally, there wasn't anyone inside. And there wasn't any crying voice sobbing miso miso. So that's it. He thought while checking it and sighed in relief. This is all, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, right after they think they're safe, he's going to get jumped by the ghost. That's how it always works in horror movies. But in doing so, the fears he had restrained seemed as if they were about to resurface once again. He resisted. In any case, he set out to examine the bathroom stall. In the stall was one of those ridiculous Japanese-style squat toilets. The moment he saw it, his hair stood on end as he felt the memories of that day resurface in his mind. Once, <laughs> once, this stall was an immoral place where I performed countless atrocities with Marie. Even though I remember those long days when I committed those indiscretions, they were all completely blotted out by my memory with that soul act. The day where I killed Marie. Because the Marie that revived in my mind wasn't the one that stimulated me. It was when she carelessly tumbled to the ground, unaware of her indecency after I strangled her. When I remembered her body, I felt just a slight sense of regret floating from the bottom of my heart. But I quickly disposed of it. Because if I allowed myself to entertain such thoughts, I thought all I was doing was acknowledging my own weakness. Take my daily meals, for instance. If I came to regret every single animal or plant I'd eaten before, I wouldn't even be able to eat a slice of bread. And then I wouldn't even be able to recall how many slices of bread I've ever eaten. <laughs> That's my attitude towards Marie. Yes. We're firmly placed in different levels of the hierarchy, and I'm placed in a higher position than Marie on that pyramid. And that's all there was to it. So things ended up as they should, and I don't need to regret anything. Just like there are no humans who shed tears. Oh my god! Oh my god! He's literally fucking Dio! <laughs> oh my god! Just like there are no humans shed tears of sadness from eating bread. Damn. You think you're fucking Dio? Really? Really? Wow. And we thought he had a freaking superior superiority conflict before. He literally thinks he's motherfucking Dio. Oh my god. Unbelievable. <laughs> you don't deserve to even lick Geo's boots. Fucking hell. <laughs> Such stupid thoughts. I can't wait to see this guy get his comeuppance, really. I can't wait for Marie and Higginbana to kick his ass and scare him to death. I think the best way for him to die would be for them to think, um, for like him to die in a way that people think he was killed by Mezzo Mezzo. Such stupid thoughts. Anyway, I have to see that if that button is here. I felt that if I didn't scold myself, I would be sucked more and more into my delusions. Already it seemed like the air of this different dimension in the old school started to eat away at me. I had to quickly pull myself out of this strange world, or else I wouldn't be able to return from it. 
A sixth sense that had molded since childhood warned me so. Damn, so he's supernaturally inclined, too. It'll be a big battle for the title of Mezzo Mezzo, but I can't wait to see him get his, his, his due, uh, his comeuppance. Jeez. I must hurry, but I have to resently and carefully, carefully set. I didn't care if it was a toilet stall. I crawled down on all fours and searched as if I were licking the floor. Ugh, yuck, you deserve it. On top of that urine, color stained floor that eternally releases foul odor. I couldn't find the button that fell off Marie. I mean, it could have fallen down the drain. Under normal circumstances, I might have thought that meant it wasn't here. But somehow I was convinced. I had no proof. I had no doubt. The button was here. It has to be here! It's not on the floor. Did I miss the spot? The moment I strangled Marie to death, the stall door was closed. Now the door was open, so I could crawl around the stall. Maybe there's something on the inside of the door, or perhaps the outside. Even though I thought there was no way the button could be in such a place, I thought that if I didn't recreate the same stall from that day, I wouldn't be able to free myself from my delusions. Hello, Mystic. Welcome to the stream. <laughs> I have a feeling Kanamori is going to be the one to die. So I carried out the first task in recreating it. I shut the door from the inside. Hello, Angie Castle. Welcome to the stream. Because it would naturally swing open if it wasn't locked. I locked the stall door. I caught a quick glimpse of the opposite side of the shut door. But the button hadn't stuck to it or anything like that. Then, where is the button? Marie died here. She was killed here. And it was here that she fell. It was then that the button was torn off. I hadn't seen it, but somehow I knew. It must have been then. Then the flashlight's beam reflected with a flash. I don't know if this is the omniscient narrator or him. Covering the top of this toilet paper was a silver colored dispenser. From its rough use by students, it had been squashed somewhat. But it seemed like it could still fulfill its role in conveniently cutting large sheets of toilet paper. And above that paper dispenser, there was a pebble that looked like a white teardrop. It's here! This is it! I slowly took it between my thumb and forefinger. There was no mistake. This is it. It's that button. It was the very button. I've been torn from Marie's right sleeve. That day, Marie had the life squeezed out of her, and when she was exhausted, those hands of hers that fought against my, my choking arms dropped with a thump. And that, and then that button, somehow caught and tore off on the paper dispenser. That's how the button got here. 
<laughs> I found it! I found it! I desperately resisted the urge to howl in laughter. I can think about this button for as long as I want it later. There's no need to overthink this. All I need to do is just drop it in the toilet and flush it like so. As the water flushed, the world of silence that could greatly haunt me was torn apart by its roaring sound. And in an instant, it swallowed off the button and its form had forever disappeared from the world above. Just as that told said, because that button can't disappear, it'll probably remain in this world. But no, one could find something like a tiny button that fell into the sewer. That would be harder than finding a bead in the desert. And so, it was the same as sending it into the eternal abyss. Basically, this perfectly erases any trace of the murder I committed. I felt the unease from that day that remained in my mind slowly clear away. As the roaring, flushing sound that had torn the silence began to slowly quiet down. I began to rise to where I was once before. Once again, I began to take back my place as a being that surpassed humans. Now... Even only my laughter was painful. I felt like I was going to burst out laughing right there. No, shouldn't I laugh? This is a world separate from the human world. And so I'm alone. Isn't this world mine alone? And so I didn't hold back. My laughter couldn't cut, cut through the silence. And once again, I exposed my existence that was more than human. Hello, Next Generation Hero! Welcome to the stream! Yep, his face reminds me of Virgilius. It was the greatest feeling! Until now, I never laughed with such joy once in all my life! And after laughing to my heart's content, after I had laughed so much I was in pain, with a lack of oxygen I needed to breathe, I set up to leave the bathroom stall. I went to unlatch the lock. Oh my god! Hell yeah, he's locked in! Oh yeah! Sorry, you're trapped in here with me. At that moment, my finger that touched the lock repelled as if it had been struck by static electricity. No, that's not the right way to put it. It wasn't as if, as if my finger had been hit by... Static electricity, it felt as if when touching it, it was better to say I had been stuck with, struck with static electricity, because... Oh yeah, mezzo mezzo time, bitches! Woo! On the other side of the door, I heard the voice of a girl sobbing. Mezzo mezzo. All the hairs on my body stood on end. I felt a huge presence pass through me from head to toe. And so I saw breathing, as if I were checking if that meta meta was an auditory illusion. But if it was real, there was no need for that kind of confirmation. Because there was only one entrance to the old school building, and after I entered, I quickly locked it. There's no way someone could come in here. There's no way there was any students hiding out at this hour. And there's no way that someone is out there! Because, because, basically hiding my breathing and checking was it itself confirmation that something was happening! But because I had to do that. 
Does that mean that I clearly heard that Mesa Mesa just now? I've got to calm down. Check my ears. <laughs> that presence of that sobbing cry from the other side of the door. It won't go away. It won't leave. I'm just hearing things. It's a hallucination. I got too excited and went and heard something that isn't there. That's it. This has to be remnants of my humanity. This has to be those damn pangs of guilt. Surely, since I came back to the place where I murdered her, I must be feeling guilt from killing Marie. And I must be hallucinating Marie's ghost inside my mind. In other words, what's out there is my desire to blame myself. My good conscience. After all. You there. Please listen to my pitiful story. <gasps> no, it wasn't a voice in my head or a hallucination. There were words that reached my ears. And that voice, it was none other than Marie's. Marie! Is that Marie? Maso, Maso. Maso, Maso. <laughs> Whoever it was only cried. But that voice, even with sobs, answered my question. But on that day, I surely killed Marie and dust her corpse into a septic tank. There's no way Marie could be here. No way. She could still be alive. Sorry, I, sl I skipped ahead for a second. Now, Kanamori was in the strange world of the former high school former school building in the depth of night. He unconsciously came to realize the logic of the spirit world. Because without being limited to the reasoning of the human world, where something killed no longer exists, he understood that on the other side of the door, the dead Marie was there. He understood. In other words, Dead Marie's ghost was out there. He understood the truth that cannot exist. That crying voice on the other side of the door. No. While Marie's ghost continued its pitiful cries, she began to condemn him with her words. You forced me to do horrible things and then you killed me in the end that was the cruelest of all uh... killing you was the right thing to do are you stupid that's the only thing I did think about it if the police found out it was the right thing to do my god if I had let you live he would probably run to a police box with those legs of yours. Those legs. Isn't that right? I wouldn't do something like that. After all, if I talked, then Sensei would distribute that embarrassing videotape. Videotape? Huh? Did you really think something like that could be a threat to you? <laughs> That's about how useful it was! <laughs> but... But... But I... wanted to return to a normal life. Because... If you'd let me return to that normal life, I would keep what you did a secret, and I would have protected it. 
You could say anything with that mouth of yours, you see. You would have said that. And then the day after school, you would have gone to the police. Isn't that right? And if you asked the police for help, you would have done as, as they said and settled things immediately. The only place where nothing changes when people ask for help are in TV dramas. But Sensei has the videotape. If I broke that promise, then Sensei would. <laughs> Even as a ghost yourself! Pathetic. Truly pathetic. Did you really think that kind of tape would compare to tipping the, the police? The police aren't stupid, you know. Before I'd realize, release the tape, they'd arrest me. I'd be arrested before I could edit myself out. You, you have editing to, I guess this isn't... I wonder what time period this takes place in. And they'd go in my house and seize the tapes. My equipment, everything would be evidence. If you truly believed uh, that tape was blackmail material, even after your death, then I congratulate you. <laughs> even in death, you make me laugh. That's how stupid you were, even in your last days. <laughs> it can't be. It can't be. Marie's sobbing was tinted with even more sorrow. <laughs> that you believed it would be used against you. I delightfully congratulate you from the bottom of my heart. Maybe you read too much manga and you want to absorb such useless knowledge and in your foolishness you probably felt satisfied in the world you created. If you even had one friend ask for help, you would have probably realized such a stupid mistake right away. But your worthless complex prevented you from making any friends. Oh my god, he actually said it! He actually he actually said it! No, my throat is okay. I, I, I have to do these kind of things to get better, LA. My god. Ji-chan, he actually said it. This world, you see, it's SOCIETY! Oh god, what did I do? Society... is made up of relationships from person to person. <laughs> and you, being denied those relationships and being left out, truly became the leftovers of society! And because of that, you truly believed that worthless tape could have been used as blackmail material. <laughs> How sad! As your homeroom teacher, I feel for you from the bottom of my heart. When I met with you and your parents, and when you advised you to make friends, you had nothing but excuses. Exactly, James. Yeah, it's to get better at doing voices. I still got a long, 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 long way to go. I think I thought you realized it. On the brink of death! Even after death, you still don't get it, do you? What are you saying? I was stupid? Oh, I see. Then I give you the word straight from my mouth. You're an idiot! A blithering idiot! Even though you're a child, you pretend to take a philosophical view on life, and you've turned your status as a dropout in society into a virtue, and you felt as if it was too much trouble to even ask for help with your sorrows and dropped out of society. You've fallen out of the very bottom of the pyramid of human society. My god, this guy is the edgiest of edgelords. Jesus Christ. 
Like he is a bleeding edge lord. Can, can can he just die, please? Oh my god. That that can't be. Ah! <laughs> Terrible things I need to experience. <laughs> That's right. That was my private lesson, you see. When confronted with a problem, you can't. That can be solved by yourself. What do you do? That's right. The answer was to ask someone for help. If you had asked your friends, your family, you might have had a chance at getting the right answer. But you didn't make friends. You didn't even open up to your family. Regardless of the instruction I gave you! And class time just ran out, you see! It's not like... It's not like time has run out! I... I didn't ask for help, but... Even though I didn't make friends, having me has been wrong and not asking for help. But I... I fought! I fought against you! As I commanded you, you began like a cat or like a dog. You threw away your human dignity, and I will admit you did struggle somewhat. But that sort of thing has no value whatsoever. This resulted in that. You drove your opponent to her, into a frenzy, and then you were really strangled to death. And your body was even thrown into a cesspool. Aside from those clumsy results, how would you like me to evaluate you? I can only say you're an idiot! No points. You get a zero! That's what they call reckless courage, you see! Rather than that kind of courage, we should have got the courage to call the police. And you didn't even do that! What you are now is a result of that. And what part of there you were saying I should praise? <laughs> they say that the only thing that can cure stupidity is death. But apparently they were wrong. It seems even in death stupidity can be cured. Would make more sense. <laughs> Even Marie's soul after death was humiliated. Who decided departed souls were stronger than the living? There is no such rule. At the moment of death, at the moment one leaves life behind, their existence is inferior. The side hope Marie, slight hope Marie held, the illusion that if she stopped being human, she could gain the strength to have her revenge after death. Began to crumble. Higginbada, we need a little help here. Come on. Thank you, Next Generation Hero. I appreciate that. I'm okay, though. I got my coffee right here. Because Marie understood now. This had nothing to do with whether or not she could become Mizo Mezo-san. Her power to avenge herself. No, the power to fight. It was the power to understand something. To do something. As much as she believed that she had the, if she became something other than human, she could have her revenge on the one responsible. In that kind of position, there was no power she could fight with at all. The ones with the power to fight are among humans. No. To fight is to live. When she gave up, when she gave up living, she had lost forever. Because she had already died, regardless of if Maurice understood what it meant to truly fight, what it meant to truly have courage. She was above the requirements to fight in that arena. 
the requirement to fight. That was to be alive. Her homeroom teacher might have snatched her life from her by listening to Ikenbana offer to turn her into a yokai. That if she became a yokai, she could rejoice in revenge. In the end, it was truly pointless and foolhardy. And at the very least, if she had the courage to ask someone for help, she would surely still be alive. Still alive, fighting, perhaps even winning. That might have been her way out of this fate. She gave it up. And so her fate resides eternally within this man, without anywhere to run. This way, even after death, she would eternally continue being shamed. <laughs> Marie's voice no longer came in sobs. They could only be described as wails. They weren't offensive as if to curse him either. Fixed with the fate of eternal shame, without fighting if she could only cry in subjugation with her lowly self. It wasn't that Marie thought her existence until now was sad, or even had regret. The thought kept crossing her mind that if she could go back to that day, she wouldn't have been violated like this. She became a victim, lost her courage and will to fight. She could no longer muster any strength. Nonetheless, she had left her will to live behind, and she came to believe in the daydream of achieving her revenge by relying on others. Does that kind of person even have the right to live? Death was expected. She didn't have any right to live, and so being killed was the obvious result. Damn. I think I have a long way to go before I'm being called excellent apparition, but I just got to keep practicing, you know? Thank you, though. I do appreciate that. Jesus Christ, they are really laying it on thick on Marie here. Oh, she's got to be able to pull together. There is no way she's elementary school young. Seriously. Exactly, Princess of Balance. By the way, welcome to the stream. And so being killed was the obvious result. In other words, it was inevitable. <laughs> so... You finally realize what kind of horrible existence you have, I see. I'm glad I gave you these supplementary lessons. I have no idea what that is, next generation hero. Jesus Christ, that's messed up in the manga. Thanks, thanks to Ryukishi for at least aging them up. Because there's no way she's an elementary school student with that sprite. There is no way. I'm glad I gave you these supplementary lessons. Finally, those lessons we weren't able to teach you something. I can tell from your cries of regret. So, perhaps we should end our class session. Ganamori reached out for the lock to the salt stall door that trapped him within. When he touched the lock, there was a tap sound, and that greatly terrified Marie. What are you doing? I'm ending class. Haven't you learned the importance of life just now? If so, then you should start over in your next life. Know what I mean? 
Huh? Huh? What do you mean? The door unlocked. The door unlocked with a crack. When she heard that sound, Marie let loose a short scream. The lock was gone. If Kanamori opened that door, he would expose the Marie that was out there to his own eyes. For Marie, the terrifying man who killed her would once again appear before her. For Marie, the living Kanamori that lay beyond that door was still terrifying. Even up until now, she never even had the courage to look him in the eyes. But Kanamori already had the courage to look directly at dead Marie's ghost. After all, those fearsome spirits had already been wiped away from the world of human reason. Kanamori knew. On the divide between before one is robbed of life and after death, the souls of the dead can only stand in the in afterlife. A miserable life will lead to a miserable afterlife. Even though she had died, Marie was still Marie. Alive or dead, she realized it didn't matter what, which side of the divide she was on. But Marie realized that all too late. Because reduced to a lowly spirit, now here she was. Well, since you can't rest in peace, it's time you showed me your wretched form. Hmm. No, no, do not open it. <laughs> it's useless, you see. Ah! With the cruelty of an executioner dropping the bladed edge of a guillotine, Connemore threw open the door. Oh my god! Wow! The Umi Neko door! And at least it's not the. The Higurashi gun door. The Higurashi console arcs gun door. <laughs> it was a bizarre scene. Even though he had opened the door from inside the stall, he was still there. In that stall. Oh my god! Did Marie pull a Beato? Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god, I wanted him to be trapped in the septic tank, but if he's going to be trapped in that bathroom stall for all eternity, that is such a good punishment for him, I swear. But Marie's figure was there, with the same appearance as the day he killed her, with the same right sleeve missing a button. With a wound left on her throat from where he strangled her to death. Uh, ah! Maria uttered a frightened squeal and backed off. But it was already a small stall as it was. She's learning how to be a ghost. Or yokai, rather. Kind of adorable on her end. Actually. With no place to run to, her back was quickly up against the wall. She began to tremble, and as she quivered in fear of Kanamori, her eyes pleaded that he not come any closer. <laughs> Truly, you are a helpless dunce. There is no test worthy of a student as bad as you. In your next life, be sure to think about what I taught you. And I'll be praying that you get a more worthwhile existence. What do you intend to do? Sensei. Since you appeared before me like this, it seems to me that you haven't fully realized that you've been killed. I'm saying that in order to fix things in your new life, Sensei is going to once again strangle you to death. No! That state of panic spilled over from when, from when Marie was alive.
Is he even going to be able to? The pain she felt when pinned to that wall of death was something only the dead could understand. That fear, knowing she would feel it once again, could only be imagined from the beyond bizarre expression left on her face. No, I don't want to. I don't want to be killed. If you don't want to, then what will you do? You should ask for help, but there is no one here to help you. Yes, there is. You're all alone here, you see. So what will you do? Oh God, yeah, oh my God. As Marie cried and screamed, she grabbed Kanamori. As Kanamori, oh my God. Hell the fuck yeah. As Kanamori's throat was gripped by both her thin arms, Kanamori's hands also grabbed hold of Marie's throat. But she's a ghost. Yes, fighting now is correct. Even if it's just for this moment. It's right, you see. But in your incompetence, you have no chance to defeat me alone. She's not alone. Perhaps I should end your demonstration. Even in death, you see, you're a fool. Even as they both gripped each other's throats, the difference in power was clear. Against Kanamori's grip that squeezed her like a vice, Marie's strength started to fade. Before she knew it, her arms no longer sought to clo choke Kanamori's throat, but instead changed to feebly resist the force of Kanamori's arms. How many challenges are there in this world that you can't win alone? In order to surmount them, people borrow power from society. It's society. We live in a society. In our final days, you ignored that. But you've come once again to repeat that mistake. If you can rest in peace, then feel free to visit me as many times as you like. Over and over again. I'll make you remember the pain of death. I'll strangle you to death. Forever and ever! In Marie's mind, the fear and pain from when she was driven to the border between life and death returned. And when with her dead body, she moaned with the pain of her neck being crushed. Now, you will die again! Marie Moria! Snap. Oh. It was something he hadn't felt with his hands when he had strangled Marie to death before. What's gonna happen? At that moment, Marie's body jerked and shuddered, and as she stopped moving, her neck slanted diagonally. <laughs> Without loosening his grip, he continued to strangle her as he laughed like a devil. I think it's... Yeah, you can't kill a ghost, silly Billy. At that moment, a voice that couldn't have been there gave it an echo. Higginbana. Oh no. Uh, game set, I see. As for which of you is more suitable to be Mezzo Mezzo San? Oh, clearly it's been decided. Jesus Christ, James. Looking up at who the voice belonged to. Above the railing between the bathroom stalls looking down at him sat that western doll he had seen in the infirmary. Okanomori could now understand the existence of non-humans. This sort of thing didn't seem eerie. 
He thought she was surely a witness to his formal duel with Marie. And so he grinned and said, Yes, I suppose this is game set. For a vessel like Moria's sons to become Mezzo Mezzo's son, it would be better if she never attained a post as one of the yokai eternally passed down to the school. I see. Allowing her the lowest seat among the school yokai is far too inappropriate. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh god. I think someone like yourself, in your wickedness, better fulfills the role you see. Oh no. Come on, Marie, you gotta do something. If it's someone like you, even among the school yokai, you'll splendidly fill and protect that seat. If a human like yourself joins us at the lowest rank, even I'll have to be careful. <laughs> I see! So it is the test that you school demons have made to decide who is more suitable to become Mezzo Mezzo son! How cliche! Oh, that's right. We voted, but there are three votes for Marie, and three votes have been cast for you. Oh, okay, so the votes. I abstain and made a different proposal. That the two parties themselves should fight out their differences. You see. Indeed. Basically, when you tossed your button in the infirmary, it was your invitation to the test. <laughs> I see! <laughs> but now it's been decided, right? I'm waiting for the other two to drop here. The test about who will become Meso Meso Song! Yes, the decision has been made. I'm so very sorry. That we could not welcome a wicked human like you. Oh yeah! Woo! Here we go! Uh, 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 uh. Here we go! At that moment, Kanamori felt a huge surge of power twist up his arms. In surprise, when he looked in front of him, Marie, whose eyes had already opened and rolled back in her head, sputtered drool and began to twist Kanamori's wrists with horrific power. That thick sound could have been the sound of Kanamori's wrists snapping, or perhaps the sound of the back of his hands being crushed. <laughs> Let go! With a giggle, Higginbana responded. Oh, sorry. Because I don't often get to meet such a wicked man like yourself. I'm truly sorry I couldn't welcome you to our class. What I wanted to test wasn't, you see, who was more vile or who was more suitable yokai. It was who was more suitable to be Mezzo Mezzo san, you see. <laughs> That's true. Mezzo Mezzo san is supposed to be a pitiful ghost. Kanamori, even though you said you wanted to become Mezzo Mezzo san, did you forget? The Mezzo Mezzo San rules. Mezzo Mezzo rules. Ah! Now both Marie's arms crushed the bones in Kanamori's hands, but they sought to wholly embrace him. But that embrace wasn't one of love. It was a malicious embrace of death that sought to crush every bone in his body. <laughs> ah! 
and the morning gave a scream as he cried while his ribs cracked. As if delighted from hearing the sound, Higginbana continued. That's right, the rules of Mezzo Mezzo San. That if you meet Mezzo Mezzo San, you must not speak with it. You must not see its true form. You broke those rules. Ugh, sorry. Therefore, Murray wins. <laughs> so good! No! More and more, the sound of one, two small bones breaking, and Kanamori's body began to leak out. <laughs> Marie, do it. As Higginbana giggled, she pressured Marie to deliver the finishing blow. But Marie let the strength of one arm go, and her expression wasn't the terrifying visage with her eyes rolled back into her head, but it was Marie's usual expression. Thank you, Sensei. What Sensei said was very filthy and painful, but I think it's as you say. If I hadn't learned it from Sensei, I might not have understood my sin even in death. I'm grateful that you were able to teach me like this. Even after death. Marie! Thank you, Sensei. From the very beginning, when you protected me from those bullies, I loved you. Give me! Ah! And then came a strange noise. Compared to earlier sounds, there were like someone crumbling up a newspaper and violently tossing it in a garbage can. A crumpling noise. Marie, you sure know how to fucking own people. But this sound wasn't light like paper. And just listening to it was sickening. A repulsive sound. Hell yeah! That was the sound of every bone in Ganamori's body beginning to be crushed to bits. Ah! Here's that Umineko CG. There was no longer a painful voice leaking out. His mouth overflowed with streams of blood. And the sound that could be heard gushing from there may have been Ganamori's dying agony that had been denied even being put into words. Or it could have been the heaving sound of everything from his lower intestines to all of his organs being squeezed out of him. One couldn't tell which. And then, I, I love how casually that was said. And then came the sound of the largest bones in his body, folding with a crack. Then all that could be heard was the cries of insects in the night. And then the two school yokai were alone. Woo! Damn! I guess he got society and <laughs> amazing James. And nothing of value was lost. Damn, I, I thought this would be like a whole arc taking up at least the first uh, half of the story, but it looks like she's she became the yokai right away. I wonder what's gonna happen. Is she gonna like climb the ranks of the yokai? Is she gonna be the number one yokai or something and climb the ranks? I wonder what's gonna happen. 
Congratulations, Mezzo Mezzo San Marie. You have been chosen. Can you hear everyone's applause? N no. <laughs> Even though every everyone should reveal themselves, they feel too important. They're all nothing but shy individuals, you see. If you don't attain a bit more power, then it might be difficult for you to perceive them. Yep! That's what the arc is going to be. She's become, she's going to become the biggest, most badass yokai in the school. Do, do you think that the school yokai and I can get along? Who knows? Maybe it'll be difficult. You couldn't even make human friends. Could you make friends with non-humans? I wonder. Uh. I'll give it my all, because if I can't relive my life, then at the very least I want to correct my past mistakes in this new one. Marie's expression overflowed with more determination than any other face she had shown until today. <sighs> there are a lot of dead and afraid of children, but a dead and determined child... Now that's unusual. Usually you see that in video games. Of course, Marie. You're an interesting girl. Mm. No. A weird girl. <laughs> Eganbana jumped over the railing. And then she took the shape of a human like the day they met in the library room. Everyone is going to want to, you to introduce yourself pretty soon. Also, I should probably direct you to our, our class. By class? Could that be Classroom B? On the name tag on Higginbana's chest, the school year was blank, but the class name, B, was written there. That name tag that had once been seen blotted out by the rain. How was it now that she could read it so clearly? Classroom B. You're wrong. It's Classroom 13. <laughs> oh my god, I'm Bridget! <laughs> the numbers have gotten dirty. Ooh, sorry about that. Yada yada, it's so fat, so... What? Nothing, never mind. Uh, something from another demon. Quite similar to me. Cl classroom 13? That kind of class doesn't exist anywhere in the school. And yet there was no doubt that classroom was in the school. Come, Mezzo Mezzo San Marie. Take the hand of the doll that dances, Higginbana. Higginbana slowly reached out her hand. After hesitating ever so slightly, Marie took her hand. It wasn't because she was scared. The job of a school yokai is tough, you know. We must surround ourselves in ill omens and wickedness as we die the dark of night even darker. E yes. And if the night was truly dark, only then will daylight brightly shine upon the school. If one wicked teacher is swallowed up by the dark night, then the day the school will become a better place, won't it? <laughs> but, congratulations! This was your first victory, right? You really strive for it, so be sure to keep a count, alright? Count? Count what? Your body count, silly Billy! Oh, 
I'm gonna like corrupting you. <laughs> yep! <laughs> oh, the number of people you've cursed to death. Duh. This was your first, you see. Oh, you always remember your first. I remember my first like it was, like it was just yesterday. N no, I don't want to count something like that. <laughs> well, that might be, might be why you're interesting, Marie. But with that kind of faint heartedness, maybe you'll even be bullied in our class. If I'm bullied, then I'll ask my friends for help. <laughs> friends? Like who? Would Hickam Bonasan please, well, become my friend? This doll that dances, Hickam Bonna, become your friend? <laughs> But I think you should wait a little longer when it comes to choosing your friends. I'm a real bad girl, you know? For a while, Higginbana, even though this was no laughing matter, split her sides with laughter. And when she was finally finished, she shrugged her shoulders. Well... If Marie is fine with that, then it's fine. If it were someone who knew the real me, then I wouldn't take up such a reckless proposal. Perhaps ignorance is bliss. <laughs> oh my god! I am shipping the ever-loving fuck out of these two now. That, that line just seals it. That line seals it right there. That line seals it. Higginbonasan, you might seem cold-hearted. But, well, I think you're a good person. That was an incredible death mystic. Seriously. I loved that. She fucking owned him. Seriously. To put it in the words of... Uh, <laughs> which is in Woodlands. That was, she like, she destroyed him. That last line of hers, the I love you, loved you, that, that was just, oh my God. Turning it right back on him. Everything, his hypocrisy, right back on him with that. Marie, you're a lot more ruthless than you might think you are. But yeah, definitely, after this line, Oh my god, that makes them an amazing couple. If they were, you know, obviously, I don't think it might happen in canon, but seriously. Th their, their interactions. Really? Yes. <sighs> Does that bother you? Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. Ship! Ship. Ship. Shippy ship. 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 Shippy shipper. Shipper. Oh, my God. Wow. Thanks. Huh? Oh my god, she was holding her hand. Higginbana let go of Marie's hand and walked down the hallway alone. It's this way. Do you see? The hallway extends. Exactly, ji -chan, exactly.
It won't come out for humans and they can't see it. Do you see it? <laughs> oh my god, James. If only. If only. And we know Ryukushi is not shy about having Yuri in the story, so who knows? Y yes I can see it! The impossible hallway extended far away into darkness. When she was human, there would be would have been a wall there. But now the hallway stretched far into the distance. Then come. Following after Higginbana, Marie entered the darkness. Okay, here we go. Yeah, that's true, Void Dweller. I wonder if they're going to find his body. At the end of the day, no one had seen Kanamori. Of course, neither had they seen Marie Moria. Damn, there's this bat that makes so much noise every night outside. But the one they called the Master of the Infirmary, the Western doll called Higginbana, was now even sitting atop the medicine cabinets. Even now, sorry. There was a rumor that inside the bathroom of the former school building lived a yokai, who was said each night one could hear the accursed screams of the pitiful teacher who had been strangled to death. Wow! In accordance with the recent school reorganization, when the school became a mammoth school bursting with pride at the number of students it contained, so too then came the same school tale about the seven mysteries, adding one more to their number. Damn! I can't wait to see like things like Higginbana's past and things like that and like to see them get to know each other better and ha and, and to see Marie climb the ranks of the yokai. Okay! And I'm guessing if I press attend then it's gonna show chapter two here. Yeah, chapter two is the spirit camera right there. Okay. So even though it's been two hours, this is kind of the it's kind of like a perfect stopping point right here. I, uh, I'm so sorry. I think, I think you guys, it should be okay, right? Stopping here because what, based on what Apparition sh said, the next chapter is, uh, around three hours long. Is it, do you think it's three hours long normally or three hours long my length, Apparition? It's not Batman. <laughs> it's squeaky sounds of a bat. So yeah, like um, uh, thanks DQA. Yeah, it seemed like it seems like a good place to stop. That was incredible. Seriously. I just want to actually. I just want to make sure. Next chapter is about the same length as this one, then, um, oh, geez. It looks like each chapter would be, uh, two streams. You know what? I'm going to change the title just because, uh, this, this, ch the chapter title doesn't really fit. Okay, so when I do this, I always ask you guys, it's a fantastic opening story. I really want to read about their further adventures as yokai. Because if I start now, then it's going to be an awkward length for the, for the next one. The thing, um, oh, most of the chapters are shorter. Interesting. I think if the next chapter is three hours reading length, I could probably get it done all in one to make it up to you guys. I, yeah, I think next time I'll just read the full chapter because I, I normally like to go three hours and I think... It would be better for organization's sake if um, if we have all of chapter two in one stream. Then I think that I think that would be I think that would be a lot more convenient for everybody concerned. Uh, so 
So yeah, you guys, I'm going to change the title of the stream because we didn't really meet the council like I thought we would be. Uh, what, what, uh, I'll ask you guys, what do you think would be a good title for this stream? You would think it would take two streams, then, um... Well, that's good. You know, two streams is fine if it's going to be two streams like this one. You doubt I could do chapter two, and even if that was a three-hour stream, you don't think I could do it in one stream? Oh, it's longer than the first by a bit. Okay. So then, you know what? If it's longer than the first, it would probably be easier to um, split into two neatly. Perfect, Ji-chan. Yup. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Yep. Thank you. Perfect, Ji Chan. Okay. You know what? I'll see because I am not sleepy right now. So, yeah, the next one you're just saying it should be easier to split into two. Well, you know, I'll see how I feel at the time. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it for today. <laughs> so uh, tomorrow, tomorrow is more ever seventeen. So if you all want to see that, please tune in tomorrow and we will continue Higginbana on Tuesday. All right. So until then, I will say so long, farewell, avoid saying good night. You are all the sweetest of hearts. See ya. <laughs>